Chapters Book Club at the Center. Our book club has been meeting since 2011 when a series of docents, a group of docents got together and decided to read the books read by our beloved Charles E. Birchfield. Since that time, we've morphed a little bit and turned into a group that reads books written by the authors from Buffalo and the surrounding counties, which is in keeping with the center's mission of supporting the talents of our rich and diverse community. Tonight is an, an especially exciting night as one of our two authors is part of our docent family. Um, I'm so delighted that she's here tonight and so happy that all of you will be joining us. Um, before I begin, I'd like to turn it over to Michaela Waros, who will explain the mechanics of tonight's meeting. Michaela? Hi, everyone. Okay, so how this um, is going to work for all the attendees, um, during the discussion, you will be able to ask questions to the authors. So if you move your mouse you at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. That is where I will be checking for any questions coming in. So just click that button, type your question, and I will, intermediate, uh, in between uh, conversations, ask those questions. Um, we are also streaming live on Facebook. So if anyone comments through the Facebook uh, page, I can also ask those questions here too. We are recording this uh, webinar, but none of the attendees are going to be recorded as only the panelists on the screen. So just so everyone is aware, um, I think that is it. So just use the Q&A button if you have a question. Thank you, Michaela. I'd now like to turn it over to another one of our wonderful docents, Jasira Gard, who will introduce the authors to you tonight. So Jasira. Thanks, Mary. Linda Dragem is a retired teacher who taught high school English for over 25 years and then went on and earned a PhD from the University of Buffalo in American Studies after which she taught for nine years in the English department at Buffalo State College. As a member of a longstanding writing group, Women of the Crooked Circle, she continues to write. She has published in a lot in the Buffalo News and some literary journals. A teacher at heart, a born teacher, she is a docent at the Birchville Penny Art Center and a presenter on literary topics at local senior centers through University Express. Christopher Dragem has been out as gay to his parents since March of 1994. He met Patrick Sexton the love of his life in 1997 and married him on board a decommissioned Washington State Ferry in Seattle, Washington in August of 2001. In 2003, they adopted a daughter, Isabella, and in 2007, a son, Jordan. We sing, oh, that I thought uh, Emily was Isabella there. In January 2012, Patrick and Christopher were legally married. In 2008, he teamed up with another adoptive parent to provide quarterly training for LGBTQ individuals and couples who are in the process of adopting. He has presented numerous workshops on LGBTQ in, in inclusive curriculum in schools. Christopher taught high school English in Bellevue, Washington, and is recently relocating to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And with that, no further ado, I give you Linda and Christopher, Thank mother and Sarah. son. Mother and son. <laughs> Thank you. I think Christopher's going to begin, right? Yes, I will begin. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to uh, read some sections from the book first for you. Um, the book goes back and forth with uh, chapters written uh, by each of us. Um, and it starts out with an introduction chapter from each of us and then um, three chapters from my mom, three chapters from me, and then back and forth after that. So I'll be reading first from my introduction. I feel like you've been gone a long time and now you're home. And I very much need to know about your journey, 
even if it was and is painful. I love you very much. And I want to know about your life and share its pain and happiness. Letter from mom, May 3rd, 1994. In the mid-afternoon of a cold March day in 1994, mom and I sat in a coffee shop in Buffalo, the city where I was born and raised, and snuggled into our latte and black tea. I had been living in Seattle since the previous fall, and I had not been home to see my parents since Christmas. Still, mom and I jumped into a conversation both searing and easy. It was a dramatic turn, and yet just one more intimate conversation between two adults trying to find their way. Over the past few years, we had spent hours in similar talks, discussing new poets we had found and troublesome students, movies we loved and politicians who drove us crazy. On this particular day though, I took things in a different direction and said, mom, I'm gay. In 1994, the year I came out, people still sent handwritten letters through the United States Postal Service. They arrived days later, especially if they had to travel across the country from Buffalo, New York to Seattle, Washington. Dad often typed his, and he was the first to send me a letter, which opened like this. As you might expect, it has been a different week for, me, for mom and me. There are a number of disjointed thoughts running around in my head, and I hope this note makes some sense to you. First, please know that I love you dearly, and your disclosure that you are gay in no way changes or will ever change my love for you. Filled with a sense of relief that I had shared a truth I had held inside for far too long, I cried reading dad's letter in the dingy basement apartment where I lived. I counted on mom and dad's unconditional love, but it was comforting to see the tangible proof there, typed out in black and white. The letters did include some questions and admissions of guilt. They reflect a couple struggling to come to terms with something they never thought too much about, something they never thought they would have to deal with from one of their sons. They discussed books that they had read and the parents and friends of lesbians and gays meetings they, that they had attended. They discussed the happiness they recognized in my life since I had come out and expressed the desire, as mom put it in one letter, to know the real you and to seek an opportunity to now be comfortable with the lifestyle that suits you. The letters continued and by the late 1990s, I suggested to mom that as writers, we should consider sharing our story. I had even found a book that inspired me. It was called, Not Like Other Boys, Growing Up Gay, A Mother and Son Look Back. And it was written in 1996 by Marlene Fantashire and her son, Christopher Shire. I sent mom a copy for Mother's Day one year and inscribed it, us next. In an email, I expanded on my idea. We could chart the journey of our family from its traditional middle-class Catholic Buffalo roots to my twist on the future mom and dad had expected for me and my brother. Instead of marrying a woman and having kids, I married a great guy and we adopted two. But the story of our family is not just the story of my coming out. It was Patrick, the great guy I married, who cut to the chase when I first mentioned a book. I love you, honey, he said, but your mom needs to tell the story of her journey as well and how that impacted your family. He was right, of course. When my brother Mark and I left for college, mom decided that she wanted her career as a teacher to shift. She started to write poetry. She went back to school to work toward a PhD in women's studies. For a good Catholic girl who was brought up on the traditional gender roles of the 1950s, her path was a radical departure, and it certainly had bumps and detours along the way. The story mom and I have set out to tell in this book is about our individual evolutions, how we pursued paths that were, for us, uncharted and filled with obstacles, 
but that we knew instinctively we needed to undertake. It is also a story of our mutual support and encouragement. We decided to let one another in, to share the journey with one another, and to become traveling partners. Here is our travelogue. Okay, mom, you're up. I'm up, all right, do I do something? <laughs> uh, oh. Can you see me or? We can see you, Linda. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, you could tell that I'm not technologically adept, so probably like many, many folks my age. Well, you're such a beautiful writer right. that you're forgiven. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit from my first chapter. Uh, Patrick uh, encouraged me to go back and, um, and yes, I guess I did change a lot from my beginning. So I'm going to start at the beginning. On the map of New York State, far to the west of Manhattan, you will find the Niagara River, sidestepping the smaller city of Buffalo. We are upstate from the great metropolis. At the northernmost tip of Buffalo, my journey begins. Born in 1942, my mother said that I started World War II and my sister Judy ended it with her birth in 1945. Not true, of course, but my mom was a great storyteller. When I was born, dad had just been hired at Bell Aircraft to help ship airplanes off to the war. We lived with my grandparents in Riverside, a neighborhood of stacked Two family, house, two family homes next to the river. My grandfather ran a small shoe repair shop close, close by. The map of my life starts here. We girls had lots of rules. Our world on our dead end street was very circumscribed. We could not even ride our bikes off the street or walk to the park two miles away. Of course, we were not expected to give an opinion or disagree with a grown-up. Such obstreperousness was met with a slap or two. Physical punishment was not eschewed in those days. Our, often, our house was filled with family, and even though my mom and grandma were not healthy, family dinners marked our lives. Christmas was the biggest celebration. On Christmas Eve, we all had to attend midnight mass Grandpa insisted on a big feast prior to that for my mother's brothers and their families, which had to be meatless by religious tradition. Christmas was a time for the men to relax with a glass of Chianti. For my mom and my grandmother, who both suffered from arthritis, it was another day of labor. When I was in about, I'm gonna skip over a bit. When I was in about seventh grade, I came home one day from school and I arrived home. Everything was quiet in my downstairs flat. No dinner was started in the small kitchen. I shouted upstairs to grandma's flat. Where's mommy? That was the day my feisty, tempestuous mother disappeared for several, several weeks. The hospital, I was told, but it felt as if she had fallen off the map. The days in our two bedroom flat were long without her, just my younger sister and me. My dad, when he got home, would go to the garage where he always had another, another project going. Often my sister and I would go upstairs and sit with grandma who was badly crippled. Though she tried to reassure us, she didn't really know what happened to mom. When my mom returned, she was a shadow of herself. Her brain had been fried with an early form of shock treatment. I tried very hard to reassure her and to support her in her fragile recovery. In a way, I became my mother's caretaker. Relapse had seemed frequent over the next few months, even years. She had fainting spells so often, we kept smelling salts under the kitchen sink. Mom told me later that doctors wanted her to move away from the home we share with my grandparents, that the strain of taking care of them as well as her own family was too much for her. She seemed proud of the fact that she refused. I need to take care of my sick mother. 
Since my grandfather was largely absent, she felt this profoundly. She did chafe in that role and resented her three older brothers. However, she never did confront them. Perhaps it was easier to have fainting spells than to use her voice. This I would not understand until many years later. Okay, I'm gonna pick up and read from chapter five. Um, and the title of this chapter is Sin. And I'll read a section um, from the middle of this chapter. As laid out in the catechism in language that still exists to this day, homosexual behavior is described as a sin. It reads, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from the genuine affective and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. The message to good Catholics attracted to members of the same sex is clear. You are disordered. Deny your natural urges. Repent of any unclean thoughts. Your pain and struggle are insignificant compared with that of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins, remember? God will punish you if you do not change these thoughts and desires. Pray for change. By the time I was in fifth grade, I did want to change. Let me be clear, at age 10, I wasn't identifying as gay, but I did know that I was different. I didn't have the awareness or the words to articulate the nature of my difference but I found that I just didn't fit in with the other boys. When we lined up in the parking lot outside school in the morning and at lunch, when we were in gym class playing dodgeball with Sister Ruth, when we sat in the library for one of Father Edmondson's lessons about the Bible, I always felt like a stranger in a strange land. The boys seemed to have a language all their own, a set of jokes that made sense only to them a way of shutting me out because I wasn't like them. In fact, I was increasingly becoming a target. You going to play cat's cradle with the girls, they whispered. Chrissy is a sissy, they taunted. Chris and Brian sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I. Mom and dad noticed that something was not quite right and decided that perhaps a change of schools would be good. Every day, starting in sixth grade, I took a school bus across the city to Camp Seast, a magnet school that drew students from all over Buffalo as part of an effort to desegregate city schools. The 45 minute bus ride carried me from the area of the city I knew so well through neighborhoods I had never seen before. The scenery was different, the school was different, and for the first time in my life, I was attending school with non-Catholic and African-American students. For some time after I started, I was filled with a sense of fear that once again, I would find myself shut out and that the boys riding in the last few seats on the bus would discover that I was different. I sat up front close to the driver in the bus aid and stared out the window as the bus made its way past St. Rose, the Carmelite Monastery, and through North Buffalo to the east side. It didn't take long for the scent of my fear to drift to the boys on the bus and the name calling and taunting began. For many who suffer through constant verbal abuse, it's difficult to recall a specific incident. Did they call me a faggot? Did they lisp and swish and drop their wrists, throw spit wads? Undoubtedly. Did the bus driver or the aide intervene? Half-heartedly. Boys will be boys, I now imagine them thinking to themselves. I know I was relieved when I got home. I know there was a tough shell that built up. I perfected my ability to ignore, to tune out. I also know that I developed a cynicism, a caustic and sarcastic sense of humor that was full of distrust and self-loathing and utter sadness. 
In the gospel according to Luke, Jesus tells his apostles that he is going to suffer a lot and be rejected by those in positions of authority. He tells them that if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his daily cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Passages such as this had a powerful impact on me. As I grew older, I denied myself by denying the impact of the teasing. Sure, it made me mad, sure it stung, but this was my personal cross to bear. And what was this in comparison to the suffering and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Okay. I'm gonna go over to um, chapter 11. Becoming a Feminist Woman. Uh, after college, uh, my older son, Mark, uh, went joined the Peace Corps. And he was sent to what was then called Zaire, now is the Congo. And in those long ago days, there was no internet, hard to believe. Uh, there letters took months. Phone calls were almost impossible. So while he was there as, as a Peace Corps volunteer in, in, in a very remote region, there was civil unrest. Eventually he had to be evacuated. But at the height of the danger, I experienced a radical shift of perspective. I of course was very, very distressed. Um, I tried calling the Peace Corps, they were less than, than helpful but I was uh, beyond myself with worry. But the shift of perspective occurred this time. Some feminists call this the click, which is when something is said or done that causes you to see your oppression up close. All looks different after that. The click happened when in desperation, I confided to, I confided to my aunt how concerned I was that Mark was in danger. Her only son had been in the Congo in the State Department years before, so I thought she would commiserate with me, which no one else had been quite able to do, or at least offer some advice and encouragement. I guess she did in her own way. Oh, Linda, you just have to pray to Our Lady. Go to Mass every day and offer it up. That was it, I thought. Is that all you have to offer? Of course, I had followed this model all along in my life, prayer and offering it up to Jesus. As our nuns told us in high school and college, Jesus suffered for our sins, so we should offer up our own sufferings, pale as they are in comparison. But this time, the advice to pray touched a deep well of anger. Is that all the church has to offer? The model for women in the church is one of invisibility and silence. Till this day, women in the Catholic church have no real positions of power. That click made a huge difference in how I saw the church of my youth and my place in it. I felt my anger grow and I stayed that way for a long time. Not at my aunt, but at a church that imposed this model of passive mother as a feminine God spirit. Since I had been such a staunch Catholic, it was a huge change for me. But I knew I could never go back to that old way of being. Certainly today, many people do not have any allegiance to an organized religion. That was not always so. Our family, our friends, our neighborhood was Catholic. It was the air we breathed. Though I knew I was not particularly saintly, I felt tied to the Catholic church. From the black robed mercy nuns in elementary school who smacked my knuckles with rulers, to grandma's paintings of suffering Jesus, to the crucifixes on the walls of my childhood home to the rituals that marked the seasons and marked our lives as a family. The religion of my family was then expanded and deepened when I went to college. 
we were required to have four years of Catholic theology and philosophy. Afterwards, I actually read theology and religion books as leisure, as leisure pursuits. It was such a deep, deep part of me. So when that clip came, it was re, it was an unraveling. All right. The final section that I'll read is from chapter 16, which is called Commitment. And um, as you heard in the uh, intro from Jasira, things have worked out pretty well for me. So no spoiler alert if necessary, um, but things got better after some of the challenges earlier in life. Um, so I'll read from the beginning of this chapter. If you were a gay male living in Seattle in the 1990s, the place to be on a Saturday night was Neighbors, a club on Capitol Hill. Beer was cheap, men stripped off their shirts and showed their gym-toned bodies, and by midnight, everybody was dancing, arms in the air, young and free and alive. I dated a guy who shared a house with another guy who was an aspiring DJ, and during the week, he would retreat to the basement to practice mixing songs. During the day, both of my friends went off to office jobs, but on Saturday nights, the three of us often ended up at neighbors, drinking and dancing. I hated it there. I hated going to the gym, so I didn't have a body to show off. I hated the way I danced. I hated the way men leered at one another. I hated that I didn't feel comfortable leering back. My idea of a great Saturday night was going out to dinner with friends and then going to the movies or a play. One actor I kept seeing on stage was this guy named Patrick Sexton. We met briefly in an audition for a play shortly after I moved to Seattle in 1993. He got the part and I went on to some smaller plays in small fringe theaters. Over the next few years, I saw him in several plays and was always transfixed. I developed a bit of a crush Patrick had a magnetism and energy on stage that was compelling. I found him devastatingly handsome. In the fall of 1996, I started working as a teaching artist for the Seattle Repertory Theater. At a training workshop, I ran into Patrick, who was also a teaching artist that year. Patrick was no less magnetic in person than he was on stage. He was kind, engaging, and a great listener. And he laughed at my jokes, a big, hearty, throw his head back laugh that made me swoon. Our first date was on Father's Day in 1997. Neither of us were spending any time with our dads that day. Mine was in Buffalo, probably crying over his grill because neither of his sons were there to celebrate him. And Patrick's father has, had died of cancer 10 years earlier. Our talk, however, did turn to fatherhood. I'm the oldest of six kids plus two steps, Patrick said. I don't know how my mom managed because my dad drank a lot and commuted two hours each way to work from Long Island to New Jersey. When I have kids, I don't want more than three. You want to be a dad too? When I came out, my mom made me promise I would have children someday, I said. This is not usually first date conversation, especially not for two gay men in 1997. Having children was the farthest thing from the minds of many gay men. Neither of us knew any gay men, single or coupled, who were raising children. But the idea that I had met someone else who wanted children as much as I did was very attractive to me. Patrick laughed his big laugh at all my jokes and made me laugh so much that I didn't want the afternoon to end. Once again, on a late spring day, promise and possibility floated in the air. I'm gonna read from the conclusion. Um, in 2017, Christopher and Patrick invited us to join their family for part of their month long road trip from Seattle to California and back, obviously. 
We join them and their children in San Francisco. We follow them in our rented car up the coast of California to towns like Windsor and Eureka. Along the way, we went to wineries, beaches, pools, and had many lovely dinners at restaurants or in our rented condos. We were delighted to be included in this family vacation. At one stop, Christopher said to all of us, I've been looking for families that look like ours during these during our trip these past weeks. Face it, Daddy, there are not many families like ours, said almost 14-year-old Isabella with a big smile. Yes, perhaps there are not many families like theirs, gay dads and two kids, but there are far more today than there were back when Christopher came out to his family and friends. As I have stated, I thought family life would not be for him. Many gay men and lesbian women still believe that. Their choices have been different. But for Christopher, family life was what he wanted. I admire the choices he has made, deviating from the norm for gay men and that he has chosen family life. He has chosen a husband who shares his goal. I admire him as a father. I always knew he would be a great dad, but he's gone above and beyond in his efforts to parent children who come from backgrounds that have given them precarious life beginnings. I value that Christopher supported me on my late in life quest to write and to gain a PhD and to teach on the college level. My efforts would have failed without his support as well as that of my son, Mark, and my husband, Bob. My family was invaluable in that rather quixotic quest. I especially appreciate that when he came out as gay, Christopher was willing to talk and to listen. He shared no anger or blame, which most certainly could have been the case. He answered questions and continued the conversation. The lines of communication stayed open and helped Bob and me to grow into better versions of ourselves. Maybe that is the final message of our journey. Keep talking, keep listening, no matter the challenges of which there are many. Well, thank you both. And uh, I know that it has been quite a journey for you. And I have some questions, but I'm first gonna to defer to Jasira, our facilitator this evening for her questions. So did you wanna have some questions? Oh, Jasira, yeah. you're on mute. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Well, um, I was really privileged to see an early draft. And one question that occurred to me right away was, in writing memoir, you're revealing such personal things. And I know from Linda's background, her mom probably would not have approved <laughs> of some of it. And you know, what could be more personal than the events in your childhood growing up, the, the troubles, and you talk about domestic violence and, and mm -hmm. your religious life, your religious life at Christopher's was especially affecting. I, I just thought that was the saddest, you know, part that you would have to struggle with sinning for your natural, you know, desires and stuff. So I wanted to know if, if you felt at all hesitant about revealing any of these deeply personal things. They're out there now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, you want me to go first? <laughs> okay, yes. I found it very, very difficult to write about my mother and her illness. Mm -hmm. I found that very, very difficult. Um, and um, I rewrote it many, many times because even though she's, you know, she's not with us anymore, I didn't want to be unfair to her. Uh, and I didn't want to reveal it, but I thought it was important because many families face uh, mental illness and um, it certainly shaped me 
in many ways. Um, I think it shaped my sister and I quite a, in many, many ways. So I thought it was important to include. And um, plus, I think Christopher kept saying, <laughs> it's okay. And he, I know he loved my mother very much. My mom and my dad were wonderful grandparents. So I trusted him that he would never want anything that would be harmful to my mother. And actually, um, when my after my mother got a little older, she was pretty open about her struggles. She 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 didn't feel it was anything to hide. So so that gave me hope too. Christopher, what do you? <laughs> yeah, I um, well, uh, just in response to what you were saying about about your mom's struggles, I think one of the reasons that I encouraged you to write about it is because those stories that I ended up finding out about her um, later in life as well as an adult um, really humanized her and I grew to respect her even more and sure it, it was painful to know about um, what she went through of course and the the devastating impact that that had on you and Aunt Judy um, and, and certainly probably her husband as well um, but also to see that in the context of, of that time period and that particular role as the dutiful daughter in an Italian Catholic family um, really uh, showed me that that experience that she had had, the, the struggles in her own life took this uh, horrible toll on her. Um, and so I grew to, to respect her even more, I think, in some ways by learning that. And, and I thought that, um, that that story about her deserved to be told. I think she was a woman, when I think about her and when I tell others about her, I was just telling a friend about her the other day. Um, she is somebody who was smart, intelligent, funny. Um, had she been born in a different time, you know, I think she would have been what a politician, a journalist, uh, a lawyer, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I see the, the, the circumstances of her life as, as having contributed to her, um, her, her struggles with, with mental illness. Um, and, and perhaps that's not true. Maybe, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I wasn't there, but, um, but that's, that's why I thought that, that those stories should be shared. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my own um, writing and my own stories, um, there were definitely, there are definitely stories in the book that um, I never, thought that I would share with anyone ever, <laughs> uh, let alone, you know, share them with my family or um, write about them in a book. So uh, to do that took some time. Um, I think uh, I, I alluded to in the, the uh, introduction section, the conversations that my mom and I had um, as a as adults, when I was an adult, um, and starting to become a teacher myself, and and we talked about literature, we both loved li literature, um, and and I recall talking about story with my mom in those conversations, and and recognizing the power of story, the power of narrative, um, and how claiming your story is such an important step for an individual. Um, and so when uh, it came to writing my own story, I realized, well, this is not just some uh, quality out there to be admired. This is something that I need to embrace and I need to recognize these moments as part of my story. Yes, they were painful. Yes, they were um, difficult to, to put out there. And particularly when I, know, when I knew, oh, okay, now, I put this down on paper and the first person who's gonna read it is, is mom and this is gonna be new information for her. That was, uh, that was, that was certainly challenging to know. Um, and then once I, I sort of got over that, 
then there was uh, a real sense of, of claiming those stories and of saying, well, this is a part of my life. And um, if I'm willing to share this, then, um, you know, I, I know that I can't be the only <laughs> teen uh, mm -hmm. or young or child who uh, one of the stories was about dressing up in some of my mom's clothes. And I, I know I can't be the only kid who's done that and has felt shame around it. So. Um, so let me claim that story and, and share that and, um, and maybe others will recognize that or maybe that will contribute to uh, something to the, the broader narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions from our attendees. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is for Linda. Uh, mm -hmm. from Judy. It says, did it come to a great surprise to you, Linda, when Christopher told you that he was gay in 1994? Yes, it did. It did. And it, and um, we've talked about, Christopher and I have talked about this, and I've talked about this with many other people. Um, did I know that he didn't fit the macho model? Uh, that I saw in my own household with my husband, my husband and my other son. Yes, but I thought he had an artistic bent, which I liked. I <laughs> valued that. You know, he loved books and uh, he was willing to go to Woody Allen movies with me at a very young age when we still like Woody Allen. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, so I knew he didn't fit the model. But he always had a girlfriend, and um, he, he, I guess he's a great actor, because he always seemed very poised in, in control of himself. Uh, I mean, the incident with wearing clothes, it's it, my clothes, it's so interesting, because I think memory is just so slippery and so interesting, because something that's great, brings great shame, brought great shame to him, which you know, I just it broke my heart to read that. Um, it's something I barely remember. I mean, you know, you're a parent, you're busy, you're teaching, you've got these two little kids and you're like, oh, they're going through a phase, you know. Um, so yes, it was a surprise. And I do remember our conversation about being a father. It, you know, we had this really serious conversation and we kind of ended it with me saying, you know, I hope you will be a, a father. And he said, well, maybe I will. And I'm like, no, you're not going to be a father. <laughs> How is that going to happen? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it was a surprise. But, you know, and then we've also talked about, well, maybe on some level you knew, and maybe I did. I would just like to talk a little bit about that, wanting him to be a father and the way Christopher told it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christopher, is that that was almost the first thing out of your mouth when he said you were gay, that, but you have to be a father, right? <laughs> and so, and he, later on in the book, he talks about having children of his own and how he had never changed a diaper or didn't have a lot of experience with young kids. So what about Christopher made you come up with that and so quickly? What was it? <laughs> uh, well, I you know, he was, uh, he had, he had subbed, he'd been a substitute teacher when he was still here in Buffalo. He worked with kids. Uh, he worked at a, a child care center when he was here and he was at into children's theater in Seattle. And um, I just thought he was good with kids, particularly, you know, he seemed very good with them. He was good with my niece, who's considerably younger. Um, and I knew I wanted to be a grandmother too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bit of selfishness in there too. <laughs> now we're getting down to it. <laughs> that was one of the things that struck me about your meeting and, and getting together with Patrick was that one of the attractions was that he desired kids also. You know, so it was like a match made for family. You know, that was one of the attractive parts that you don't find in gay bards with the dancing necessarily. 
Not that it's not here, but. Mm -hmm. Right, that was, um, that was definitely one of the reasons that I, I wanted to write about that um, in the section that I read today was because it was, it did stand out so much. Um, and, and thankfully things have changed in the last, mm -hmm. what, 13 years. Um, but it was pretty radical at that time um, for us as gay men um, to, to say that we wanted to do that and to sort of claim that as something that we saw as a part of our life um, and, and thought would be possible. Um, and, and I will say that, um, that uh, probably even before we had a commitment ceremony, it was my dad who would clip, new, uh, clip articles from the newspaper um, and send to me with little notes in the margin saying, see, these guys did it, you could do this. Um, and uh, so that was that was actually quite lovely. But um, you know, we see now like Anderson Cooper and um, uh, that other guy from Bravo, his friend. I can't think of his name right now. Um, but uh, you know, I've I've read some of the comments that they've made, and they they will say the same thing. And they're men of of my generation, right? Who say, yeah, we just never thought that it was going to be possible for us to do this thing, and that was certainly. Um, what we felt at the time. So to, to be, uh, to find someone who also wanted that and um, ostensibly was willing to go on that journey with me, it was like, that's gold right there. Uh, <laughs> and he is gold. <laughs> he is, he is. And I want to say, I did not know that they talked about it on their first date till he wrote about it. And I was so excited when I when I read that. I said, "Really? You talked about that right away?" Uh, but then, I mean, they were so. Patrick is so nurturing too, and they both seem so family oriented. I, 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 I think we talked about it after you were you had the commitment ceremony, and you were like, "Yeah, this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen." So that was good. So we have a ton of questions coming in from our attendees. So um, I'm just gonna go into the order which they came in. So the first one um, is for Chris. Chris, how did your upbringing in a conservative, conservative town help or hinder your journey? Uh, wow, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Um, well, I, I would say that it, it did um, it did hinder it in some ways. It it made the journey um, difficult, I think, and and challenging. There were definitely um, there were definitely some some obstacles in the way to to coming out. When I uh, one thing that I I tried to write about in the book was was both the environment in Buffalo and then the environment of the, the time period and just the, the lack of um, visibility and the, 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 the lack of presence of, uh, of gay and out gay individuals leading um, happy, productive lives, which really for a, a long, period of time through my adolescence and, and into um, my young adulthood um, really uh, forced me deeper into the closet and um, made me uh, want to convince myself that I could change. Um, and uh, there's a section in the book where I talk about going to see a therapist to um, uh, didn't necessarily call it conversion therapy, but essentially was was encouraging a practice um, that was very similar to conversion therapy to try to um, get me to uh, sort of work myself out of my homosexuality, which you know now is sort of a ludicrous idea. And when I tell people about it today, they think, "What? Who was that nut job?" Right? And so. Um, uh, 
certainly the the um, environment. I guess the the question really is about the environment in a in a maybe a more conservative um, uh, city. Um, and I guess maybe in some way deep down, um, that was one of the reasons that I left Buffalo and moved to Seattle. And it wasn't until um, pretty shortly after I moved to Seattle that I did come out. So I think that uh, perhaps environment did have something to do with it. I, I write in the book about the experience of being in Seattle and, and telling people that, you know, I thought maybe I might be gay and just getting a sort of like non-reaction to it. Like, oh, that's great. Oh, good for you. Well, whatever. Um, and that was something that I had just never imagined would uh, be the reaction of people. So I hope that answers that question. And this next one is for Linda. Linda, how did you handle friends or family that did not understand all that happened? Uh, I presume that he, that Christopher came out as gay. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I have to say uh, pretty much everyone was, was uh, supportive. Um, it was the rare person who said anything negative to me. And um, I talked about in the book, I wrote about my uh, neighbors who we were very close to, but they were very staunch uh, traditional Catholics. I mean, they were the kind of Catholics who bemoaned the fact that they didn't, you know, that the Latin mass had been overthrown by Vatican II. So they were that kind of Catholic. Um, so telling them was the most uh, challenging. Um, and luckily, uh, while one neighbor, you know, was not supportive, I can't say, but didn't at least said, did not say anything negative. Uh, another neighbor um, revealed that she had nephews who were gay. So, uh, so it, it, uh, I have to say that most people were, and, and once Christopher came out and he said, um, and he said that he didn't want to hide anymore, I took that as a um, as my mantra too that I was not going to be silent about it and that uh, I would tell as many people as possible. And when I was teaching at um, particularly when I was teaching um, at Buffalo State, uh, we you know we would of course uh, consider issues of gender and um, sexual orientation and uh, ethnicity in in the literature classes particularly. But I would say that right up up front because I would assign journals, and I'd say, look, I'm the parent of a of a gay son, and if you are not accepting don't put it in your journal because i am not going to be happy about that so i'm just going to tell you that right up front um because uh i i, I just knew there was some residual homophobia in, in some people but i didn't have to deal with it too much truthfully this next question i'm going to bring jasira back into the group here a little bit um just because i know she was a part of the feedback of this book. What kind of feedback have you had from friends and family and readers? Well, Jasira, you can you can talk about that. Um, I was just having been raised Catholic myself. To me, uh, Chris's struggles just. I, well, my brother's gay, and was raised very Catholic, and had a troubled youth, shall we speak. And my sister's gay. So, but that didn't happen till late in late life for her. But um, I just felt terrible about what you were going through. I mean, isn't it sad and painful enough to struggle with not being like others, but to also feel like you're in a state of damnation you know, mm -hmm. that God disapproves what you do. It just breaks my heart. Um, 
it's not my God who feels that way. <laughs> it's like a friend of mine wasn't going to get insurance because it was an act of God. And she said, not my God. My God didn't do it. <laughs> so um, I just found that very, very painful to read what you went through and all on your own, you know, all on your own, you in your conscience and uh, anyway. So I, I think any, anyone who was raised Catholic that the, the religious struggles were really, really powerful. And of course with feminism, you know, that's a whole separate story right there. So it's, it's two really powerful religious spiritual struggles. Um, and then one thing I'll slip my little question in here. Um, that I really admired about both of you was the way you folded it into the history that's going on, what was going on with feminism. You were late to the party, uh, Linda, you mm -hmm. know, um, a couple of years, not by a lot. So, um, and of course, Sto when was Stonewall? I don't know, you know, but, Mm -hmm. But Chris and Linda both fold that, that fold in what's going on in the U.S. And my question is, did you have to do some separate research to nail down some of that stuff, or did it just flow flow as part of your writing? I think Chris, you did a lot more of it, mm -hmm. of the history of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for well, for me, it was um, it it became pretty clear when we were trying to uh, cra uh, write the story and 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 um, and sort of craft the narrative to really be conscious about setting it in a very specific time period and and um, that the 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 story of uh, a gay man um, coming into his own five or ten years uh, before me would have been completely different um, and five or ten years after when I came out would be completely different as well so it really um, needed to be grounded uh, from my point of view in a particular time and so um, that's why I I felt the need to 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 do some research and you know I I had the the sort of bare bones of it but yeah I mean I you know I had to do a lot of research to dig up the specifics and and to to get all the details down. Um, I had a friend who uh, who studied in the seminary for a while and and said, "Man, you have such a great memory of all those all those Bible passages." I was like, "Are you kidding me? I I just <laughs> looked them up. Like I googled them. I don't, I don't remember them all." <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of research. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I did some research too. Uh, some of didn't, the didn't the, read like that. It read very a very organic. Um, way of doing it, especially the Bible passages to seem like they were haunting you. Yep, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you're both born educators. You didn't pass up the opportunity to like teach a little history while you were at it, I guess. Right, right, right. Right, and, and the, 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 the chapter on marriage, I really wanted to contextualize marriage because um, I thought it was really important. Um, certainly at the time we were writing before the uh, ruling, the Supreme Court ruling, it was such a uh, charged issue, I think less so nowadays, although not gone away, not gone away, um, that, it's, that it's debatable. But um, I really wanted to make clear that it's had evolved over centuries. And, and uh, so I did do some research on that because I wanted that to be perfectly clear. I have one quick question that really plays off of the idea of Catholicism. And that is, what role does the Catholic Church play in your lives today? Does it, or have you moved from it? Or I didn't, I wasn't able to glean that from the book. Yeah, well, uh, for me, I guess, you know, I, I consider myself maybe a recovering Catholic or a lapsed Catholic. Um, 
the idea of Catholicism as a sort of ethnicity or a, a part of who I am is, is undeniable. Um, and there are many Catholics, um, both friends and family members who I love dearly and, and um, who are huge parts of my life. Um, I recently had a friend who passed away and, and uh, went to his you know, Catholic funeral and, and I'm there and I'm part of the service, but um, it's not, uh, it's not a, um, I don't practice. Um, so yeah, that's me, mom. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, my relationship is much more um, charged, I would say. Um, I, I rarely go, I rarely attend mass now, but I, I still call myself a Catholic and um, the values have been so steep, deeply steeped into me. Um, and I, you know, I still value the, the ritual but there's so much about it that has been so repressive. And um, I, I hate what it did to my son. And I hate what it did uh, to me too. I mean, to many women, I think, uh, part of, uh, but the values, the spirituality uh, is still there, it's still there. And, and I still find such power in, in the, the New Testament and the words of Jesus. So, so I'm kind of on the fence, I guess. <laughs> so this next question from our attendees, this is for Chris. Uh, Chris, what advice would you give to an aunt whose 18 year old nephew uh, revealed he was gay? And a part B to that question is how can this and uh, be more supportive of their nephew. Hmm. Wow. Um, I mean, I think that the thing that you would want to let any child know about anything at any point <laughs> probably is just that they are loved and they are respected and they are valued. Um, and, you know, I, as a teacher, I see many 16, 17, 18 year olds who just don't get that message enough. Mm -hmm. None of us get it enough, really, um, quite frankly, I think. Um, and uh, the, the, the biggest thing that you can do to help that person is to remain open and to ask questions. And I think, Lots of times people are afraid like, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing or I'm going to fumble all over my words or, you know, uh, I have to know exactly how to talk about it before I do that. And I, I just don't think that's true. I think if you approach it with humility and a, a general sense of curiosity um, and if you, you know, if you have questions, ask them. And I think the biggest thing would be to, to ask that child or ask that, not child, um, young adult, how can I support you? What can I do for you? How can I let you know that, um, that I do love you and, and value you and care about you? I wanna say something about that because um, after Christopher came out, um, that was, I, I felt the same. I felt as he, as he said about people wondering how to talk about it. And I felt the same way, you know, well, do, are, am I saying it the wrong way? Will I be offensive if I ask a question? Um, and he was, Christopher was very open. He said, we can talk, you know, you've got questions, you can ask. Uh, and that made just so much of a difference for me that we could talk and we could um, be open and, you know, make mistakes and fumble, but, but get back to stay connected, stay connected. And I was thinking about that today um, because I think it's a similar situation, um, probably in a much deeper way with the issue of race, because I think that, that uh, people have such a difficulty talking about it because part of it is 
well, what if I say the wrong thing? Will I offend someone who happens to be black? Um, uh, you know, but I think what Christopher is saying, if we just go with humility and with openness and and say, I want to know, I want to, I want to find out more. Uh, that makes a big difference. So this next question is from Shara. Um, she says, hi, Linda, I was in your writing class at Buff State as a 53 year old adult and you encouraged me to send an essay to my view. I want to tell you that I have finished a novel which will be in this book club, September's Choice. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> uh, so thank you that for the encouragement. Correct. <laughs> so My please join please. us in September. I will, absolutely, that's wonderful. <laughs> so Shara's question is, uh, did you and Christopher read and edit each other's chapters as you wrote them, or did you just uh, each finish your own sections and put them together afterwards? Um, was there any disagreements over what you wanted to include or leave out in the book? Huh. Well, I think we read each other's as we were writing, didn't we? we yeah. Did. yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, we, we read each other's as we were writing and we gave feedback to each other. Uh, we worked for a long time. Uh, the The whole process of writing the book took many, many years, probably at least 10, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Um, and, and over that period of time, it really grew and changed. At first, we were thinking it was just going to be a collection of letters that we had written, um, letters and then emails going back and forth. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe we'll add a little bit to that and maybe we'll Maybe we'll uh, have chapters that are sort of grouped around themes like marriage and parenting. Um, and then uh, finally, at some point in the process, we worked with a, a developmental editor who um, read a lot of what we had and, and said, you know, I think that you really need to tell this story um, sort of chronologically and you really need to let the reader experience those different time periods and how it flowed. And even the, the going back and forth, which, um, we had at one point been cautioned uh, against doing and it's it can be a little tricky to to track like whose voice am i following now um uh that the idea of following the the time uh sequence of events was was a, a stronger way to do it and and i agree i think in the end it it plays as a more powerful um story uh, to to watch our growth over time, both as individuals um, and as a family. And and I, I will take this moment to, to note that um, it really is the story of our family. And we um, both, you know, my brother and my dad are, are huge parts of this book, um, as are, you know, my kids and my husband and, and my niece and nephew. Um, and and aunts and, and grandparents it's it's really the the story of our family and and mm -hmm. um the 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 challenge for all of us as a family not only um as a family dealing with uh, a, a gay son and a gay nephew and a gay brother but uh, a family dealing with uh, a woman who was pushing against um the the gender roles and gender expectations uh, um, of the time um and that family to sort of figure out how they were going to to deal with these things that they just never thought that you know they would have to deal with or never expected to deal with or perhaps didn't know how to deal with but the the um the openness and the the willingness of that family unit to adjust mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so this next question is from ruth have your kids uh, encountered any discrimination because they're growing up in a non-traditional family? If so, how have they dealt with it? Mm. That's a great question. Um, and I, I suppose I'll have to ask them later to see. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I checked, they hadn't um, uh, experienced anything that they were sharing with me. I mean, I think um, thankfully 
they have come of age during a time when there are there's far more visibility there's probably more acceptance although whether that acceptance is complete and total is is definitely not the case um but they have friends they have friends parents they have others in their family um who are all out they have powerful strong women um who they see and respect. Uh, and so I think they've, at the very least, developed a, a language to respond to others um, and feel pretty empowered <laughs> to uh, respond in ways that, that would push back. Um, and so I'll, I'll have to ask if they've <laughs> experienced any specific uh, challenges, but thank you, great question. That's a good question. Um, I would say, I remember when, is, uh, I don't think she received any feedback from school when Isabella started kindergarten and first grade, but it was all about mommies in kindergarten and first grade. And so she, she felt some, some, ish, you know, some pain about that, about her, her, the lack of a birth mom around. Uh, do you, you remember that? Yeah. Uh, so that was an issue for her, but I don't think anybody went out, you know, I don't think anybody was making her feel bad about that. Just, it's just when you're a kid in kindergarten, everybody talks about their mommy. So. This next question is from Julie. Uh, Linda, can you speak a bit about your feminist evolution and Christopher, could you share how you have seen your mother evolve over the years? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, hmm. uh, well, I think, I think the biggest thing is that um, my husband's been supportive. Uh, and I think because we're both teachers and uh, we both contributed to the family. Um, I think that um, that made it more uh, important for, for him to see me as an equal. Um, but um, I guess I would say that uh, reading a lot, reading's a very terrible thing to do, right? Because <laughs> when you read a lot, you're, you're, your consciousness is raised. And then I've had strong female friends all the way along. And now I have very strong female friends as well, women friends. So I think that that helped me along. And certainly um, what what really uh, pushed me in the direction, I would say, is my family background, because I saw how my mother suffered, and I saw how uh, many of the women in my family had abusive husbands, um, that, that it made me sensitive to the issues of women, so that when I, when I uh, was choosing uh, an area to explore when I was uh, starting my program at UB, it was easy to be drawn to women's studies. Uh, in terms of my mom's evolution, um, it sort of never occurred to me because I, I just grew up having a mom who seemed to sort of do it all, right? Who had a job and, uh, did even under my dad's admission, the lion's share of, of raising my brother and I, and certainly um, coming home and, and cooking and cleaning, um, as well as working full time. Um, never occurred to me that, that there was anything unusual or strange about that, I guess. Um, although as I grew up and saw that, well, you know, um, my aunt didn't perhaps make some of those choices, same choices, um, and then learned more about women's roles in society and was educated about those things. Um, 
the big aha moment for me was uh, this period in the, the time after I graduated from college when I was living in Buffalo and, and starting to have some of those conversations with mom. And she was writing these wonderful poems about women in her family. And there were these stories of women, um, her aunts and her uh, mostly aunts, uh, I, I guess your grandmother as well and your mom, um, and just these stories of that rocked my world and, and made me think, oh my gosh, I never knew that this happened to the to the women in in our family. I've never heard these stories, um, and that was a, a sort of real wake up call. And then I write um, also about uh, hearing this poem called "Confident Women" that my mom wrote, which is still one of my favorite poems of hers, um, and that sort of spun me out into a whole new direction of like, wow, this is my mom. Uh, <laughs> this is somebody who I would seek out in my English classes and want to talk to more about, you know, all this cool stuff. Um, so there was, uh, in that particular moment, there was a real recognition of, of her as a uh, a woman um, and as a feminist um, and um, and it's been lovely um, getting to to know her as both of those things fully and not just to see her as that mom who can do it all but um, actually as somebody who struggled with some of those things and and pushed up against some of those things um, so I, I have seen that evolution and still continue to see it. I think um, even in, in some of the writing of the book where I think mom wanted to focus more on just my story. And I had to say, mom, we, we have to tell your story too. It's, it's just not, my story is just not that interesting on its own. Uh, it's the fact that we, we both met these challenges and uh, and both were pushing up against these two things and, and doing that together and, and both impacting the change for our family that, that really makes the story interesting. And so it was sort of ironic to have to, to do that and pull that out of her. And I just wanted to say, but mom, you're a feminist. Come on, you know your story's important. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> well, I, I will say, um, when Christopher came home after college, he was home for about a year, right? And I think I think that was when we really uh, began to see each other as, a, I mean, I think he began to see me as, as a person instead of just a mom. And I think we started forming an actual friendship. So that was, a, that was just a delight that we could be, I mean, we'd always been, you know, you know, mom and, and, and son, but I think we became more and we, we shared some of the struggles that we'd gone through. And for some reason, when I started writing, I didn't start writing until the 80s when I went to the writing project. When I started writing poetry, some for some reason, I started writing a lot about the women in my family. And one of my, my friends from my writing group said, you want to give voice to the voiceless. That's what you want to do. That's what you're, what you're, what you're trying to do. And I said, yeah, I guess that's it. I, I didn't realize it, but that seemed to be what was happening. Beautiful. Jasira, do, do you have other questions you'd like to ask? Really, I, I thought I saw one that looked interesting. I thought it was from Marion. Um, and it was maybe over, you know how people sneak questions into the chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, maybe how has, uh, yeah, I see how has the writing the book changed your relationship to each other? Has it, has it changed? Hmm. Well, it's the, the, um, the, idea of having this project to work on um, was especially important to us when I was living in Seattle. I just literally just moved back to the East Coast. 
Um, but, yesterday. <laughs> uh, but when I was living in Seattle, we, you know, part of the idea of, of sending that book to my mom and, and saying us next and what do we think about doing this and we both love to write um uh when we when we talked more about it we thought well this will be sort of a great project for us to engage in like even if it even if it doesn't turn into anything mm -hmm. um this will be something that keeps us connected and it it really did that it it functioned a, as a uh uh, uh, sort of a, a glue that that kept us strong and kept us um, involved in each other's lives and, and sort of pushing each other and and um, deepened our relationship in a lot of ways because I think that um, you know we we both got to those places in our writing where we again to to get back to that idea of us sharing some some painful things along the way and having to maybe relive some of those things, um, you know, uh, that, that deepens a relationship and it, it, it pushes it to a new level. And, and we always said along the way, like, this is, uh, our, our relationship is more important than a book. And if we ever get to the place where we feel like this is going to, to harm our relationship in any way, then, we're just gonna put it to the side because it's more about the relationship. Yeah. I, do you think that's accurate, Mom? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, reading about Christopher's struggles in, in uh, high school particularly was very, very uh, painful to read, but I thought it was important. It was important to know. I mean, important for, for both of us, for both Bob and I to know and to know him as a full human being and what, what he went through. So, uh, yes, I think it deepened the relationship. And, um, and I liked that he pushed me. I thought that was good. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I think we pushed each other to, yeah. to, to keep, keep on the track, yeah. And our, our uh, editors sometimes pushed us. Uh, put our developmental editor, I know sometimes I was like, no, quit asking me these questions. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to write about this. Uh, she, she was wonderful. She was really great. And our, our friend editors were, were, were helpful too, to kind of push us. So we have one more question um, before I go on to how we can, how people on this attendee can Find your books. Um, this one is about, is this wonderfully revealing book being used for education, support, and enabling uh, enhanced awareness for the personal worlds of others? Hmm. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is in that, um, you know, the, I guess this gets back to some of the feedback that we've gotten is that, uh, so far, the some of the feedback we've heard from others, whether they're family members or friends or or strangers, um, is that it it has been eye opening. It has raised awareness, um, and um, hopefully that will continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, every time I have written a, a piece, an op ed piece, um, not that I wrote a lot, but I occasionally get published in the Buffalo News. And I've written about uh, Christopher, about gay and lesbian issues. And, um, and whenever I do, I run into somebody who tells me, oh yes, I have a gay son, a daughter, I've got a, a, an uncle. Um, and I think, I, uh, they tell me that it's helped them to, to, to see uh, about our family and the same thing with the book that it's it's helped them to read that. So I hope that's true. I'm certain it is. <laughs> I'm certain it is true. Jasira, any closing questions for you? I know you wanted to mention the Buffalo Public Library, so I'm going to. All right. After you well, ask your question, you can talk about the library. If you well, I was excited to see a question from somebody who wants 60 copies, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's several copies at the Buffalo Public Library and 
probably in Philadelphia and certainly in Seattle, you know, if the library doesn't have a book that you want and value, they will get it for you and for the whole library. You just email them and say, how about this fabulous book, you know, order it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, and of course, we want to um, promote the independent booksellers. Um, even during COVID, they will get the book to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I have had re a re request for signed copies. So I'm going to ask Christopher to please describe how one can go about getting a copy. Yeah, I know you texted great. it in the chat box, but. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, um, we're just so thrilled to to be here and be able to participate in this. Thank you for for having us. Thank you to the Birchfield and um, of course to Mary and um, Jasira. Um, and the there, I think there was a, a question there about how is the book being promoted, and um, it we were published through um, through NFB Publishing, a small um, publishing uh, company in Buffalo, which was such a thrill. Um, but as, su uh, as such, we uh, weren't working with a publisher that has tons and tons of money. Um, and they've, they're not sending us out to large stadiums across the United States, um, which isn't Call happening now on. anyway. So <laughs> I guess we wouldn't have had to worry about that. Um, but the, the biggest way that the book gets promoted is just by people talking about it um, and perhaps sharing it through their social media um, contacts and networks or through emails. Um, and so if, if you've read the book and in, enjoyed it and, and can do that, that is great. Um, we have been doing a few of these uh, kinds of virtual events and, um, and, and enjoy them um, as much as we can enjoy not being together in person, which we would much prefer. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're happy to continue doing these kinds of events. So if you do belong to another book club and you think that book club might be interested um, please do let us know. I put in the, the chat um, that the best way to contact us is through our website and it's pretty simple. It's just dragem.com. Um, and um, the book's available on Amazon. You can get um, uh, a, um, you can get it for, through Kindle on there as well. Um, and uh, any independent bookstore, um, if they don't stock copies, they are able to order it through their channels. Um, and get it to you. And as Jasira mentioned, most of those independent bookstores are tripping over themselves to get you copies of books as quickly as they can. Um, so if you don't need the book two days from now and can hold off on ordering it from Amazon, order it from your local bookstore um, and, and they will uh, no doubt find a way to get it to you. Um, and there are going to be a few copies available, uh, signed copies available through Birchfield. Um, and if you're interested in those copies, just getting in contact with us through um, through our website. Right, um, I, I do have some copies that you could purchase uh, through, uh, through us. And um, as Christopher said, through the website and um, if you let me know, I'm visiting Christopher on the 9th next week. So I'll take the, the books that I have with me and we'll sign them and I'll bring them back and leave them at Birchfield and hopefully we'll be opening up soon. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Mary can, you know, you can let me know. I'll be happy to facilitate that. So great. Feel free to email me and we'll make sure that happens. Uh -huh. So before I say goodbye to everyone, I just want to invite everyone back next month when Brandon Stipney, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, will, whose book, Five People You'll Meet in Prison, which is a memoir about addiction, mania, and hope, will be our featured presenter, along with a book he wrote called An All-American Monster, The Story of Timothy McVeigh. Uh, Brandon was once a... Uh, I, uh, what's the word I'm struggling for, a writer for the um, Union Sun Journal out of Lockport, and he'll be joining us. And then of course, A Time to Wander, which is 
um, Shara Thompson's book, along with N.F. Johnson, will be in September. Right. But before we go, I just want to thank Jasira uh, for facilitating this evening, Michaela for all your help, but especially want to say a big thank you to Linda and Christopher for being with us tonight, but also for your wonderful, important book that will serve many people really, really well. So thank you. I'm going to applaud. May I, may I add a PS only because poetry was Linda's gateway to her feminist growth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read a brief poem that's in the concluding uh, chapter and it's just very special. So thank you, Jasira. Thank you. When you were small, we danced, we sang, wove zinnias into garlands, played house with tiny plastic people who never fought and had perfect families. <laughs> we created villages of Legos full of symmetry and peace. You slept on the floor of our room when thunderstorms split your rest. I tried to soothe away all fears till life pressed in too much for us both. Did the cocoon I tried to spin hold you back from saying your reality? Now your bravery takes me away, pushes me into my own flight. May we both become who we are. The title was Sundance Prayer. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, thanks so much. Mary. See you later, alligators. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.